February 8th, 1942, a routine flight takes off from Rostenburg Airfield in East Prussia. Fritz Tott, the German munitions minister, is on board. He's returning to Berlin after a meeting with Hitler. Soon afterwards, a man is awoken by startling news. Todd's plane exploded soon after takeoff. The minister is dead. Was he assassinated? The man answering the phone should have been on board the plane as well. Now Hitler appoints Albert Speer, the new munitions minister. It is a crucial turning point in the relationship between the two men. What binds them together? Is it more than just friendship? He admired Hitler, and it was a sort of love. Between Speer and Hitler, there was a kind of loving relationship, though it was never erotic, never homosexual. The dictator has his favorites. Hitler was incredibly important to Speer as a person, as a father figure. And he never said he should have abandoned Hitler. Never. In his new role as minister, Speer promises Hitler a miracle of arms production. In reality, Speer is an architect who sees himself as an artist. He knows little about weaponry. Meeting the challenge of organizing arms and munitions for Hitler's war will be a tall order. Speer is a prime example of modern managerial material. He is smart and efficient. This man stands out from the rest of the Nazis. He's courteous and educated and prefers civilian clothes. He's the urbane Nazi. I think you would be the victim of a huge delusion if you allowed yourself to be impressed by the facade Albert Speer erected. After all, there are documents, including letters from Speer, which bear witness to his cruelty and his involvement, his direct and personal involvement in the most terrible crimes. Speer claims to be above politics, but power is of huge importance to him. Without Speer, Hitler's Third Reich would probably have collapsed earlier than it did. He's a man with many faces, whose influence on the regime was perhaps greater than anyone else's. How was that possible? I myself wonder how I could have survived those years as an intelligent person who attempted to behave with integrity. Even as a young architect, Speer, born in Mannheim, had only one aim, to achieve success in the eyes of the world. As an early member of the Nazi party, it was Speer who designed the speaker's podium for the regime's first mass rally, held at the Tempelhoferfeld in Berlin. From the first time I met him, I was captivated by his very appearance. Early on, Speer is virtually obsessed by his mission, to present Hitler in the most effective manner possible. He becomes the theatrical director of the regime and is the natural choice for major tasks, such as building the arena for the Nuremberg rallies. He's an architect intoxicated by the spirit of the age. Hitler promises Speer a great future and the opportunity to make architectural history. Speer's biography provides a key to understanding the Nazi dictatorship itself. For decades, the author Gitte Zereni has been trying to establish how a young man from a good family, an intelligent person with no political ambitions, could have become captivated by this tyrant. 
He came to see himself as destined to be an architect, as the greatest architect Germany, or the whole world for that matter, had ever seen. And the curious thing is that he told me, and he said the same thing to other people, that he didn't originally rate himself so highly as an architect. Okay, when Hitler. But once Hitler started seeing him as a great architect, it was as though he decided he would become one. Speer, just 30 years old, is a member of Hitler's inner circle, with an open invitation to stay with the Fuhrer in his private residence at Obersalzberg. I always have time for you and your plans. Hitler flatters his architect. No other family enjoys such proximity to Hitler as the Spears, and their children, Albert and Hilda. If it could be said that Hitler had a friend, it was me. Margaret Speer must increasingly share her husband with the Führer. On the one hand, it was a fine opportunity for me to discuss the plans with Hitler, which meant that work could proceed smoothly. But of course, I was also proud to be one of the few people invited to stay at Obersalzberg. Apart from me, only Bormann and Göring were provided with a place to stay by Hitler. And there was another important factor, the fact that I had such close access to Hitler earned me considerable respect among the political figures who surrounded him. And I would never have been able to accomplish my task as an architect, which required a great deal of money and other tangible support, if I hadn't been respected as one of Hitler's closest associates. They are united by more than a love for architecture. The most interesting point here is the whole Hitler-Spear relationship. I mean, it was a very special relationship. There was something between them. They had a certain feeling for one another. Hitler regarded Speer as a substitute son, and Speer was also the sort of character that Hitler himself would have liked to be. And for Speer, Hitler was a father figure. There's absolutely no doubt at all about that. Hitler declares the reconstruction of the capital as the biggest construction job of all. Speer is also ordered to construct a new chancellery building in just 12 months. The architect displays great managerial skills and hires over 8,000 workers. Willi Schelkes was involved in the construction. He was a fantastic organizer. For instance, he didn't just commission one company to build the basic structure of the chancellery. He had three, four, or five of them all working on different parts of the job at the same time. That was the only way to get a building like that finished, a huge building like that, in such a short time. In fact, Speer invites Hitler to inspect the finished chancellery two days before the deadline. For the first time, the Führer describes his architect as a genius. In January 1937, Speer is appointed General Construction Inspector with almost unlimited powers. His task is to turn Berlin into the world capital of Germania, based on the dictator's own ideas. The triumphal arch, 50 times bigger than the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, is to be the central axis of the new Berlin and stands at the beginning of an avenue three miles long 
and over 100 yards wide. This is what it would look like today had it ever been built, a monument to Hitler's fantasies of omnipotence. At the other end of the avenue rises the Great Hall, the biggest building in the world and large enough to hold 180,000 people. Speer's plans for Germania are a testimony to Hitler's ambitions of world dominance. While the German army invades Poland, the architect continues to work on Hitler's vision of the world capital. The huge scale of Germania makes the Brandenburg Gate seem almost insignificant. At the supreme headquarters of the German army, Hitler decrees, once a year, delegates from the nations that have been conquered will come here to marvel. And at the very top of the dome, Hitler imagines the German eagle, not astride a swastika any longer. The crowning glory will be the eagle astride a globe of the world. Naturally, I put it to him that he must have realized where all this would lead. And his reply was, you ask that question, but the answer is quite obvious. Of course, I wanted Hitler to rule the world. Yes, I wanted that, because as far as I was concerned, he was the greatest man in the world. Speer and Hitler tour occupied Paris in June 1940. Now, the dictator insists, everything in Berlin must be bigger and more impressive than the buildings in the French capital. Hitler is at the peak of his power, with his architect, Albert Speer, at his side. It lasted for 12 years, and the first seven years, up to about 1940, were basically happy times for Speer. They were wonderful years, years when he didn't know what unhappiness was like. Speer perceives himself as a non-political artist, just a manager, always at the service of his superior. Even when he's on vacation, he checks how the work is going. Speer sends a telex from Hitler's residence in Obersalzberg to ask about the clearance of Jewish apartments in Berlin. The new world capital is to be free of Jews. To make room for Speer's construction work, buildings and entire districts are to be demolished. Acting on the orders of the general building inspector, 23,000 Jewish apartments are registered and cleared. Speer is closely involved with the crimes committed by the regime. But how much does he know? He had vision that only looked up and that it never looked to his fellow men who were living around him, that he was uh, sort of a prisoner of his own ambition. The construction manager had many logistical considerations. For his prestige buildings, like those in Nuremberg, Speer needed stone. So he made a pact with SS chief Heinrich Himmler, as indicated in a recently discovered document. In 1941, Speer indicated a need for red granite from Natzweiler in Alsace for the construction of the German stadium at Nuremberg. The original document is now in the German archives. A concentration camp was built at Natzweiler solely to meet Speer's needs. Otherwise, it would probably not have existed. Among those who toiled in the quarry for Speer's stone were members of the Dutch resistance, men like Pim Rentjes. Working in the quarry was a very tough assignment. People who weren't used to that sort of thing simply couldn't do it. They would be beaten up or shot by the SS, or they just died in the quarry itself 
or later back at the camp because they were physically destroyed, exhausted, utterly exhausted. 20,000 prisoners died in Knotzweiler, either in the camp or in the quarry. The letter to Himmler establishes Speer's involvement. Only now, 60 years later, do Pim Rentjes and his brother discover who was behind their suffering. When I read this today, I realize that Speer was evil. I came to understand what that word meant in the concentration camp. Speer had that on his conscience. The Führer consults with his first munitions minister, Dr. Fritz Tott. Tott was a devout admirer of Hitler for many years, yet he urges him to stop fighting a war on two fronts before the tide turns against Germany. Hitler refuses to listen. On February 8, 1942, Tott dies in an unexplained aircraft explosion. The cause of the incident remains a mystery. By the time the funeral is held on February 12th, Todd's successor, Albert Speer, has already taken over. However great our grief at this death, that felt by the Fuhrer is even greater. We all hope fervently that our unceasing efforts will help him overcome this sorrow. For the success of our labors is crucial for German victory. I have vowed to the Fuhrer that I shall apply all my energy to the task of achieving that goal. 1942 is the year when everything changes, and not just for Speer. In March, Allied bombers begin their attacks on German cities, targeting residential areas and armament factories, as in Lübeck. Ever since the advance on Moscow was slowed by ice and snow in December 1941, it has been clear the Soviet Union will not fall quickly. But the German war economy is not prepared for a long haul. How will Speer, the new manager, deal with this problem? And why has Hitler appointed Speer as munitions minister? Speer was always regarded by those in the Nazi party as something of an outsider, someone who had never really embraced the National Socialist ideology. This was quite true. He hadn't, and therefore he had no power base in the party, which was crucial and was, in my view, the main reason why Hitler appointed him munitions minister. Hitler felt he had found a first-rate organizer, someone who apparently had no power base in the Nazi party. So Hitler assumed he would be able to influence Speer's whole attitude to the armament industry. Hitler believes he has found a willing instrument in Speer. He believes Speer's lack of experience with arms is insignificant. If a wine merchant like Ribbentrop can be foreign minister, then an architect can be munitions minister. Speer learns quickly. He studies production statistics, visits arms factories, and tries to convince everyone that he is the right man for the job. He may be Hitler's favorite, but he's resented by his colleagues. From the beginning, the new minister is the target of envy, malice, and intrigue. On February 18, 1942, Speer invites leading industrial and armament figures to Berlin. To their surprise, they are confronted with an unprecedented demand. They are to sign a document authorizing Speer to take complete control of all armament efforts. Everyone around the table knows that Hitler supports Speer unconditionally. It was a kind of internal seizure of power with the full approval of the Führer authorizing Albert Speer to take complete control of everything concerning the armament program that included economic factors, production, and everything else that was connected in any way with armament. And this was only the first part of Speer's plan to gain access to other powers, a plan he executed with considerable confidence over the following months. 
Powerful industrialists like Alfred Krupp von Bohlen und Halbach, shown here on the left, arrive at the Führer's headquarters in Vinica. Industrialists find a way to deal with Speer, partly because his new system promises good profits. At the same time, the new master of the economy insists that industry should be more responsible and hire more experts and fewer bureaucrats. He transforms a minor ministry into the center of the war economy, extending his jurisdiction with single-minded efficiency. Plans that fail to win his approval are rejected with his personal comment stamped on them. Not decisive for war effort, return to sender. Speer's thirst for power becomes particularly obvious to Reich Marshal Hermann Göring. As commissioner of the four-year plan, Göring is a sort of overlord of the economy until Speer takes charge with Hitler's explicit approval. This footage from May 18, 1942, shows the manager attending his first arms show with Hitler. Speer's power and his relationship with Hitler are now dependent on the arms production figures. By the summer of 1942, arms production has increased by almost 60%, while ammunition output has doubled. At the same time, Speer is counting on the war, reaching a speedy conclusion. In April 1942, Speer says, We must win the war by the end of October, or we shall have lost it forever. Now it is Christmas, and the minister visits German troops stationed on the Atlantic coast of France. At the same time, an entire army perishes at Stalingrad. Hitler, so trusted by Speer, orders Stalingrad to be held at all costs. Speer's brother Ernst is also trapped in Stalingrad. He writes shocking letters home. and like hundreds of thousands of others, is lost in action there. After the defeat at Stalingrad, Speer begins to doubt Hitler's leadership in the war for the first time. Though he remains loyal to the regime, his relationship to Hitler undergoes a change. Construction projects like Germania were set aside long ago. Arms production is now far more important. The friendship between the two artists takes on a new dimension. Now the relationship is that of a manager to his boss. So now he was a member of the cabinet, and Hitler presided over the cabinet, which naturally meant Speer received orders from Hitler that he was reluctant to carry out. He started to complain that Hitler was treating him in a completely different way. In public, Speer appears to be doing well. But despite his jovial appearance, Hitler's manager is ruthlessly pursuing his own agenda. Speer now demands a radical mobilization of the war economy. The occupied territories are to be exploited to ensure that arms production can increase yet again. Now women are to work in munitions factories as well. Students and teachers are to manufacture weapons. The losses at the front oblige the German army to call up the reserves. 700,000 workers are conscripted. Speer has to make up this shortfall. He demands forced laborers from the occupied territories. By August 1942, he is using 700,000 forced laborers. Just a year later, the figure is three and a half million. By the end of 1944, over seven million people are enslaved, toiling away for Albert Speer. He could not be held responsible for the murder of the Jews. He actually did not have anything to do with that. But he was entirely responsible for the use of forced labor. And he knew precisely what the conditions were like. He claimed later that he had no idea they were mistreated and so on. But that is not true. He must at least have known the basic situation. Perhaps he did not know any details, but it is absolutely certain that he knew what was going on generally. So, of course, he lied about it. 
The quarry at Mauthausen concentration camp is one of the many places where people were literally worked to death. These pictures capture the horror at Mauthausen. Speer claims he saw nothing like this when he visited the concentration camp on March 30th, 1943. Yet after his visit, Speer complains to the official responsible for the camps, SS Chief Heinrich Himmler. Speer writes that the prisoners' accommodations strike him as too luxurious. He tells Himmler plainly, We must adopt a new approach to the construction of concentration camps focusing on achieving the greatest efficiency for the lowest possible investment to attain the best results. This means we must immediately introduce primitive construction methods. On September 16, 1942, Oswald Pohl, head of the Central Finance and Administration section of the SS, writes to Himmler. Reich Minister Speer has approved in its entirety the proposed extension of the Auschwitz barrack facility and has furthermore made funds totaling 13.7 million marks available for additional construction work. This is the period when Auschwitz is being transformed into a death factory. In 1943, Pohl reports that Speer has been informed of all the details and has also approved construction of the crematorium and the disinfestation facility for special treatment, the euphemism for mass murder. Margaret Speer rarely sees her husband these days. Their marriage is in crisis. Their six children, including daughter Hilde, pictured here, effectively grow up without a father. Meanwhile, Speer is already seen as Hitler's likely successor. These pictures show Speer on October 5th, 1943. The following day, October 6th, Speer attends a conference of senior Nazi administrators in Posen Castle. Many members of the Nazi party, especially those who have been with Hitler since the early days, are suspicious of this young upstart who has recently become so powerful. Speer wants to cease all civilian production, now administered at the local level, and concentrate solely on war production. The Nazi district administrators, called Gauleiters, will no longer have any special powers. Speer goes on the offensive in his speech at Posen Castle. The present system, which allows individual districts to exempt themselves from factory closures, must not and will not be allowed to continue. Therefore, Unless each district meets the production requirements I have set out within 14 days, I shall decree these closures personally, and I can assure you that I am authorized to assert the authority of the Reich in this matter, whatever the cost. After Speer, Himmler makes a speech on the final solution to the Jewish question. I am talking about the evacuation of the Jews, the extermination of the Jewish race, this is something that can be stated quite clearly. The Jewish race will be exterminated. Speer maintains that he didn't hear Himmler's speech and that he had already left for a meeting with Hitler. He was never able to prove this conclusively. Could the most senior manager in the Third Reich have been unaware of what was going on? Speer tried to prove that he wasn't present when Himmler made his speech, and it may well be that he wasn't, but he was certainly told later all about Himmler's speech. The very next day, in fact, the Gauleiters who had heard Himmler went to see Hitler the following day, and Speer was already there. He had gone to see Hitler immediately after making his own speech with a friend of his who was also a Gauleiter. Kaufmann was his name. And when the rest of the Gauleiters turned up, they were all talking about that terrible speech when Himmler said everything so clearly. On December 18th, 1943, Speer attends another arms show with Hitler. The meeting in Posen has had an effect on Speer. The munitions minister seems shattered. How 
much does he know about the murder of the Jews? At Christmas 1943, Speer turns his back on all this and flies to Lapland, the furthest corner of Hitler's empire, far away from the intrigues and from the crimes he is increasingly implicated in. Deep inside the Arctic Circle, Hitler's manager needs time to think. By this stage, all his friends knew what was going on, and they knew he must have been aware of it. And his Hitler had done all this. In January 1944, Speer is admitted to the SS hospital at Hohenlüschen, to the north of Berlin, with a severe knee infection. For months, he conducts his official business from here. The doctor treating him, an orthopedic specialist, is an old friend of Himmler's, Speer's rival in the struggle for control of the economy. Before long, the patient begins to have doubts, almost certainly justified, about his treatment. For three weeks, he is unable to move at all. A pulmonary embolism becomes life-threatening. He believes the doctor is trying to kill him. His wife, Margaret, is told that she should prepare herself for the worst. Speer's secretary overhears Himmler speaking with the doctor. All right, so he's dead. The less said about it, the better. When you study the history of the Third Reich, it becomes clear that it was extremely dangerous for someone like Speer, someone in a senior position, to be sick and therefore out of touch with what was going on around Hitler. It was dangerous because there was so much intrigue. The leadership was rife with intrigue and it took up a great deal of time. While Speer is wrestling with death, his opponents in the ministry, Karl Otto Zauer and Xaver Dorsch, seen here at a construction site, take advantage of the opportunity to extend their influence. They spread rumors that Speer is incurably ill and no longer believes in the so-called final victory. For the first time, Hitler doubts his loyalty. Will he abandon Speer? The patient laments his fate in a letter. My Fuhrer, this is the first time that you have been dissatisfied with my achievement in the sector for which I am responsible. Speer offers to resign. Hitler sends a reply and instructs the messenger, Tell Speer I'm very fond of him. The old bond between them seems as strong as ever. Speer will remain in his post after all. Speer claims in his memoirs that now, after years of hectic euphoria, he begins to think about the career he is pursuing at Hitler's side. Suddenly, he says, he is able to see clearly. On May 8, 1944, the manager is back in his office. Four days later, on May 12, 1944, American bombers attack the German fuel industry, the nerve center of the arms effort. 90% of fuel production is destroyed. Speer mobilizes 350,000 men to rebuild the installations. He tells a colleague, The race between destruction and reconstruction is the most exciting competition in world history. Between June and August 1944, German armament production reaches a peak. This also applies to the aircraft industry. Speer manages to place the entire air armament industry under his control. It is the keystone in his economic empire. Yet again, he achieves record production figures. This comes as a bitter blow to the American Air Force. A total disappointment and even when those figures became available 
it penetrated the military mind. The general, I won't name him, who had been in charge of that operation, was in the room with us as these figures were put on the screen. And I was sitting near him. And it was a, something you will never expect to see. The tears ran down his face, and he said, did I send those boys to do that? An increase in aircraft production from the, after the bombing. Three months later, the deceptive production figures plunge. Speer tries to inspire optimism in the factories, though he knows the reserves are now exhausted. Our vengeance weapons will demonstrate clearly to the entire world that the German arms technology is more advanced than any other. And I can assure you that the enemy should be prepared for surprises, and not only in the areas where fighting is conducted at present. It may be that the course of the war will bring further setbacks for us, but we know that the end of the war will bring victory for us. Speer tests his limits of endurance. At the same time, he bombards Hitler with memos, openly warning him that economic collapse and military defeat are a real possibility. Earlier, he had always discussed his problems with the Fuhrer verbally, but now he started sending memos. It was an attempt to prepare the ground for a discussion he had planned, but the reaction to the memos was always exactly the opposite. The result would be the contrary to what he had actually intended. Manfred von Poser, seen here on the right, has been Speer's assistant since December 1943. In the winter of 1944, he accompanies Speer on an inspection tour lasting several weeks. Speer wants to prolong the hopeless war, but he questions the execution of Hitler's scorched earth policy, which would leave the entire country in ruins. Hitler has already warned his manager. I shall not tolerate any disobedience, Speer. When the war is over, the German people can pass judgment on me for all I care. But anyone who challenges my authority now will be hanged for certain. That was the crucial point. I rarely saw Speer as furious as he was about this refusal to consider the needs of the German people after the war was over. He wasn't desperate in the sense that he gave up, but he was furious. And that made him feel he had to do something. Speer hurries back to Berlin and writes a final letter to Hitler. I have achieved a great deal for Germany. Without my work, the war may well have been lost in 1942 or 1943. I cannot believe in the success of our good cause if we destroy the very basis of our people's existence in these crucial months. Speer is already thinking of the period after Hitler, perhaps imagining himself as minister for reconstruction. He tries to avoid carrying out Hitler's orders. Hitler decides to forgive his minister, on April 23rd, Speer travels to Berlin once again. It is my view that he was anxious about being Hitler's successor. It was an extra burden for him, whichever way he looked at it, in terms of a possible verdict against Hitler, as was later the case at Nuremberg, though this couldn't be foreseen or because of the demands facing anyone working on the reconstruction of Germany, which he did see himself doing. In the bunker under Hitler's chancellery, with the city of his dreams in ruins around him, Speer says farewell to Hitler. The news of Hitler's death reaches Speer on May 1st, 1945. Given to him by his mentor for his birthday. 
As he stares at the photograph, Speer recalls after the war, he is overcome by tears. Only now has his relationship with Hitler actually come to an end. In fact, Speer will never escape Hitler's shadow. I swear by God. Speer now faces responsibility for the actions he performed as Hitler's manager. On November 20th, 1945, Speer faces the Nuremberg Tribunal for the first time. The main charge against him concerns his responsibility for the forced labor program. Speer is the only defendant who accepts overall responsibility for the crimes that were committed, but he denies any personal guilt. First count, American judge guilty, hanging. Russian judge guilty, hanging. British judge 20 years, French judge 15 years. They were hung up. Speer is spared the death sentence. Instead, he faces 20 years in prison. Well, at the time, I thought that was a, it was a, a, a justifiable sentence. Uh, I didn't make the judgment, but uh, they saw him in court every day. They saw this man who uh, acknowledged responsibility compared with uh, his colleagues on the dock. And maybe they drew a comparison. Maybe that's the way to understand that sentence. This was the the man who said, I'm responsible, and the others denied responsibility. If the court at Nuremberg had known what we know today, Speer would probably have been sentenced to death. The manager writes his memoirs while incarcerated in Spandau prison. There's not a word about his guilt for the deaths in Natzweiler, the expansion of Auschwitz, or those who died in inhumane working conditions. 20 years to the day after he was sentenced, Albert Speer walks out of prison with a book in his luggage that will sell millions. Perhaps I'll give you some idea what the last two or three days have been like. All very exciting, of course, but I am happy to be back outside after 20 years. The world watches as Speer embarks on his third career, first architect, then manager, and now writer. When I talked to him, to Albert Speer, I couldn't get out of my mind the thought that this person shared responsibility for the deaths of millions of people for the deaths of very, very many Jews if not all of them. At the same time, he had an extremely cultivated manner. He was thoroughly courteous and friendly. But that was just the tactic he adopted, and he was very clever at applying that tactic. Yet Speer never escaped the shadow of his past. Speer's crime his, his blindness, his failure to appreciate the excesses which were occurring around him. Albert Speer had just one goal, to succeed in the world. For him, it was power that mattered, not humanity. And as Hitler's manager, he made choices that increased his power. Only now, decades after he was convicted and sentenced, has the full extent of his guilt come to light. Including letters from Speer, which bear witness to his cruelty and his involvement, his direct and personal involvement in the most terrible crimes. Speer claims to be above politics, 
but power is of huge importance to him. Without Speer, Hitler's Third Reich would probably have collapsed earlier than it did. He's a man with many faces, whose influence on the regime was perhaps greater than anyone else's. How was that possible? I myself wonder how I could have survived those years as an intelligent person who attempted to behave with integrity. Even as a young architect, Speer, born in Mannheim, had only one aim, to achieve success in the eyes of the world. As an early member of the Nazi party, it was Speer who designed the speaker's podium for the regime's first mass rally, held at the Tempelhoferfeld in Berlin. From the first time I met him, I was captivated by his very appearance. Early on, Speer is virtually obsessed by his mission, to present Hitler in the most effective manner possible. He becomes the theatrical director of the regime and is the natural choice for major tasks, such as building the arena for the Nuremberg rallies. He's an architect intoxicated by the spirit of the age. Hitler promises Speer a great future and the opportunity to make architectural history. Speer's biography provides a key to understanding the Nazi dictatorship itself. For decades, the author Gitte Zereni has been trying to establish how a young man from a good family, an intelligent person with no political ambitions, could have become captivated by this tyrant. He came to see himself as destined to be an architect, as the greatest architect Germany, or the whole world for that matter, had ever seen. And the curious thing is that he told me, and he said the same thing to other people, that he didn't originally rate himself so highly as an architect. But once Hitler started seeing him as a great architect, it was as though he decided he would become one. Speer, just 30 years old, is a member of Hitler's inner circle, with an open invitation to stay with the Fuhrer in his private residence at Obersalzberg. I always have time for you and your plans. And it was a sort of love. Between Speer and Hitler, there was a kind of loving relationship, though it was never erotic, never homosexual. The dictator has his favorites. Hitler was incredibly important to Speer as a person, as a father figure. And he never said he should have abandoned Hitler. Never. In his new role as minister, Speer promises Hitler a miracle of arms production. In reality, Speer is an architect who sees himself as an artist. He knows little about weaponry. Meeting the challenge of organizing arms and munitions for Hitler's war will be a tall order. Speer is a prime example of modern managerial material. He is smart and efficient. This man stands out from the rest of the Nazis. He's courteous and educated and prefers civilian clothes. He's the urbane Nazi. I think you would be the victim of a huge delusion if you allowed yourself to be impressed by the facade Albert Speer erected. After all, there are documents. Hitler flatters his architect. No other family enjoys such proximity to Hitler as the Spears, and their children, Albert and Hilda. If it could be said that Hitler had a friend, it was me. Margaret Speer must increasingly share her husband with the Führer. On the one hand, it was a fine opportunity for me to discuss the plans with Hitler, which meant that work could proceed smoothly. But of course, 
I was also proud to be one of the few people invited to stay at Obersalzburg. Apart from me, only Bormann and Göring were provided with a place to stay by Hitler. And there was another important factor. The fact that I had such close access to Hitler earned me considerable respect among the political figures who surrounded him. And I would never have been able to accomplish my task as an architect, which required a great deal of money and other tangible support, if I hadn't been respected as one of Hitler's closest associates. February 8, 1942, a routine flight takes off from Rustenburg Airfield in East Prussia. Fritz Taut, the German munitions minister, is on board. He's returning to Berlin after a meeting with Hitler. Soon afterwards, a man is awoken by startling news. Todd's plane exploded soon after takeoff. The minister is dead. Was he assassinated? The man answering the phone should have been on board the plane as well. Now Hitler appoints Albert Speer, the new munitions minister. It is a crucial turning point in the relationship between the two men. What binds them together? Is it more than just friendship? Uh, he admired Hitler, 